We have been conditioned in modern culture to uh, believe in the data-oriented form of transmission. And while we all crave something else, while our heart craves something else, uh, the mind is always there saying, I really need this in order to feel comfortable. And what I would say to people is, in medicine, you are a transmitter of the laws of nature. And the closer you come to how nature operates and how the heart of nature operates, the more effective you will be in your art. And so transmission, in a way, is an experience that comes from surrendering into a slipstream of knowledge uh, that you can't, the depth of which you, and the widths of which, and the lengths of which you can't imagine. And so it's just the willingness to be open. And then once you surrender into it, you will uh, emerge in a different way. And that different way will, one step at a time, will enable you to become a healer in the greatest possible sense. transmitted uh, in the presence of a master that's different than what goes through a book. 那老师他也有这么一个问题,说我们这次走了这么多地方,也是。There was uh, one time uh, before his death, he called me to him and uh, said, I want to remind you there will be a time in your life you can't go forward, you can't go backward, you can't stand in the middle. Everything you do, you'll be criticized for and won't be right. Uh, she was like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, it's like, I can't go forward, can't go back. And he said, he said, you got to die right there. And she said, how am I supposed to die right there? And he never said anything after that. So for years, she walked around with this koan, not understanding what it meant. Only several decades later, during the so-called Cultural Revolution, she understood what he meant. At that time, she was criticized for being a Guomindang member and for being a counter-revolutionary, which was a very bad label to have at that time. She said, how can you? I was a member of the uh, counter-Japanese movement at the time. Also, the communists were fighting the Japanese. We were all in it together. How is that a counter-revolutionary act? Uh, I said, uh, just forget it, I, I won't talk to you guys anymore, you have like no reason. That was in the middle of the so-called uh, uh, criticizing session or something like that. So I just stood there with my head bowed and, uh, and wouldn't talk, say anything. Uh, but at that, that moment I understood what uh, my master had said decades earlier. So I can't go forward meaning uh, can't be progressive or can't go on the attack, can't go backward, I can't hide or uh, I can't be a backwards kind of person. At that moment, there was no middle ground at all. So the advice of the master had been uh, die right there. And I understood at that moment what that meant, which meant I had to let the part of my ego die 
they cared. Uh, and I was just thinking, they can criticize me all I want, they're not criticizing this person, this person doesn't exist. And at that moment I even got happy and I started smiling and people got really mad and said, look at her, look at her, she's counter-revolutionary, she is, she's even laughing at us, she's mocking us. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. so this is a very important part because 20 million dead people during the Cultural Revolution, I'm adding this now, and a lot of those people, they jumped out of windows, they committed su suicide, they died of grief because they couldn't understand that other people had such harsh opinions of them. Uh, even people in their own families, their own students. And she survived the, not only the Cultural Revolution, but now um, more than uh, 30 years later, she's, she's still alive and healthy because she just made it through it and go like, those people, they're just on a too low level, they're just crazy. I don't need to care what they think about, it's just not right. The important thing is if you really want to understand something, you need to make it your own. And that's why true masters sometimes they say nothing or they just say in the right moment, they give you one sentence and then you got to chew on that sentence and find out in your own life what that means. And once you understand it, you'll understand it forever. I remember arriving in China and I was still somewhat shaken uh, physically and uh, th I was aware I couldn't just uh, hold up a billboard and say I want to look for a, a classical Chinese medicine teacher or a Qigong teacher in the street and find one but uh, this was the time when Qigong for the first time was permitted to be uh, to come out to the general public in China and there was a big stack of books called um, which roughly translates as uh, the, the esoterically transmitted Taoist uh, Jin Jin Gong School of Qigong. And I, I opened the book and it had the flavor of something that I wanted to learn. And especially touching to me was the autobiography in the back where he, uh, Wang Qingyu, who was the author of the book and who ended up being my main uh, master teacher later, he wrote about his, his uh, experience with his own teacher when he was 12 years old and that touched something very deep in me and I, I set out uh, on, on a mission to find this person but I thought China is big. He probably lives in Beijing like most famous authors do in China and so uh, when that evening I happened to visit my friend Gloria from Cornell and I saw a picture of her Qigong group and it was, seemed to be the same man who had written the book. And uh, I said, uh, could that be? And I, I brought the book that had some pictures in it and compared them. He said, yes, this is him. And uh, I said, you have to get me the address. Because she said, he definitely doesn't live in Beijing. He's from Chengdu. And, and uh, she found the address. And I just walked up to his house one evening. And he opened up the door and I introduced myself and I said, I want to study with you. And he's a very uh, hidden man from his perspective. And he, he said, uh, I have a number, many students, I have few disciples, but none of them has ever just walked up to my door and found me like that. So, But 
from that moment that I thought was a lucky moment, it took one and a half years until he actually started teaching me something and accepted me as a disciple, a formal disciple. And in the meantime, to the chagrin of my wife, he just watched Chinese soap operas, which was the most grueling and torturous uh, test of character I've ever endured. This is part of Taoist instruction, of course, is that Tao means a path, including the path of transmission. So he says it would be not aligned in alignment with the Tao if he would be practicing a form, uh, the history of which we don't know. The people who lived and breathed that form, we don't know. So he says this is an appropriate moment now that we finished learning the form uh, to, to hear about his teacher. So the biggest principle of all ancient teachings is you see something at the surface and there's something hidden underneath. Every tree has a root. So our purpose of cultivation is always going back to the root. It's a door that we can go through to to find our deeper root in ourselves. And as part of that process of reaching that root, it's extremely important to have gratitude for that lineage, to have gratitude for what you learn. If later in life you find yourself in a posi position where you heal somebody with your hands that have been strengthened with this practice, or you see something uh, in your inner eye that changes your life because you're doing this practice, never forget where it came from. There's many people walking on this planet at this moment because they profited from, from me healing them with what I learned from my teacher. And or many people became famous because they, they could do what they otherwise couldn't have done. No matter how hard my life was, there's not a thing I would want to change with one exception, and that is, I never had a chance to repay my teacher. I never had a chance to even say thank you to him. Um, so later in life, I tried three times to see him and to personally thank him and express my limitless gratitude for him and his teachings and his compassion at a time when I really needed it. Um, and I never could do it, and this will follow me into the grave. He taught me how to respect the earth, he taught me how to respect heaven, he taught me how to respect people and how to heal people. And uh, for that I wanted to thank him very badly. So 
Every time I relate this story, and this is not the first time, I feel like sourness in my heart. I feel like my, my throat is big, this big lump forming in my throat. The human being, after all, is a... Uh, is, is, yeah, okay. <laughs> For him, the lineage wasn't teaching some people boxing and martial arts. He felt like he wanted to teach people about what it means to be a human being, what is uh, our relationship to the universe, what's our mission in life, and uh, he wanted his students to learn about herbs and healing. And most of his disciples came when he was banned for 20 years in the mountains, and people wanted to learn martial arts from him to f defend themselves. So there was a lot of cigarette smoking and a lot of uh, tough talk, but there was not that soft or uh, feminine side of the healing aspect uh, that he wanted to see. And so over the years, uh, he kept approaching me with this idea. And uh, it, uh, after being with each other for almost 15 years, he, he, he decided that he was getting old and he wanted the lineage to be passed on and that uh, this was our Yuan Fen. That wasn't his decision to ma be made, but that the universe had made that for him, that I, he, I was brought into his life. And time and time again of walking together, he felt like we emerged. Uh, even we've seen a lot of difficult times together, and that every experience we had together brought us together more deeply. So. Wang Feng Yi, or the legend of Wang Feng Yi, is somebody I personally have encountered as one of the few people in modern life. He died in 1937, but um, he looms large uh, as one of the last um, proponents of the classical way of transmitting and living from the perspective that he completely surrendered his own personal agenda to the transmission of knowledge that was sincere, urgent, and large in the way how the universe is large. We are here in Heilongjiang province. I have the privilege to be in a very small village in the house of uh, Mr. Liu. Uh, we are about 200 miles away from the Russian-Chinese border. We are here to witness firsthand the uh, workings of the, the method of Wang Feng Yi that is still being practiced here, uh, very close where the old master first started with a student of a student of his. Uh, and we are now in his house. He's called Liu Shanren, Liu the, uh, the good man. Uh, and his wife is sitting next to him, who is, uh, they are very well known here in this area by taking care of uh, sick people from all over the country that live here for free, eat here for free, and get treated here for free. So he's really uh, uh, completely committed to healing people in this way that is called Xin Li Liao Bi, uh, which is the um, uh, art of treating through the heavy duty disease through the uh, five emotions. Around us, we have uh, lots of people who are in the typical fashion, how this is being conducted, uh, are being uh, coming here for treatment, including some of his former patients that have already been healed and might share their sh stories with us. Uh, but there are also some new new clients here. Uh, uh, 
和人与病的之间的关系，是吧？人为什么能够生得长病，是吧？因为人，呃，本应该不应该长病，心肝肺脾肾上有病了呢，那是什么呢？无影的毒进来了。所以呢，人呢，呃，把毒收进来之后。说无影的东西不知道是怎么来的，那是由什么来的？恨怨恼怒烦。说有毒就得长病啊，去毒才能好病。作为比方来说，你跟张三生的气，你上李四身去找去，那不好使。你非得像那咱们上火车似的入座对号，就生气。就上火，生气上火就是做病的根源。可惜现在人都不明白了。他就是这样，他这嘎子，你想长个疖，长,长一个东西。哎<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>照的心里暖洋洋的啊！ He's saying this is symbolic. The tiger, the sun in her heart goes comes up, so the sun in the heavens here comes up as well. 王雪就乐吃这玩意儿，行了。She's becoming a new person, and she won't be mad at her mother-in-law anymore. 哎呀，走吧！哎呀，得坏一坏，我走。你要怎么样能做的有利于人的事情啊？你那男的先生，你出来这社会工作，你们做了不是为了你自己，你做都是为了这大伙都。Theory of the five element can be there is a generating cycle and a and a overcoming cycle. And you can explain the theory of war with that systems theory of the world, where you first had some kind of uh, weapons that are made from the earth. That then, earth gets controlled by wood. Then you use some kind of wooden sticks to overcome that. Then uh, wood gets controlled by metal. So you use like swords and knives in order to overcome that. And then metal gets controlled by fire. So you use like nuclear bombs and all of this fire powder. And but in the end, fire gets controlled by water, and water is the element of peace and of getting along with each other on every level. And so, uh, in the end, that's what we're all striving for, and that's how the cycle is ending. Namo Oh, Lamo, Xiao Zai Yen.
受了师父，阿拉摩小在言受了师父，阿拉摩小在言受了师父，阿拉摩小在言受了师父，阿拉摩小在言受。小在延寿了师父，哦，那么小在延寿了师父，哦，那么小在延寿了师父，哦，那么小在延寿了师父。哦，那么小在延寿了师父，那么小在延寿。